Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Hello everyone again, and welcome to the third Coast Water Seminars. My name is Svetlana Taylor. I'm Technical Program Director at Current. I'm filling in today for Elena Harkness, who is Executive Director of Current and who usually hosts these seminars. So very tough shoes to fill, but I'll try my best. On behalf of our university partners listed here, Northwestern University, Argonne National Lab, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, the University of Illinois at Chicago, and the University of Chicago, I'd like to welcome you to this seminar series where we will showcase the latest water-related research. Some logistics uh, at any point during this event, you're welcome to post your questions to the presenters, uh, to the presenter. In the Q&A section, you're also welcome to put any comments about this event in the chat. During the presentation, please make sure you are on mute and that your camera is turned off. So this is our agenda for today. Uh, in the beginning, I'll say a few words about current. Uh, I'll then let our uh, Dr. Seth Darling, who is one of the core creators of the Third Coast Water Seminars introduce our presenter today. Our focus presentation will be on the issue of biofouling and scaling in reverse osmosis and nanofiltration systems. It's a very important topic for making this membrane systems more reliable, effective, and water efficient. And just to bring it home, uh, reverse osmosis is not only used for desalination, we actually have a water treatment plant near Chicago that uses reverse osmosis. And reverse osmosis is also one of the leading alternatives for removing PFAS uh, and other contaminants of emerging concern. So it's very important and exciting topic. Uh, at the end, we'll have some time left for questions and answers. So please don't forget to put them in a QA and a section. Um, all right. So let's go ahead and get started. I apologize for <laughs> trying to uh, do this. Um, not very perfectly, so my apologies. So current, um, current, if you're not familiar with current, is the Chicago's Water Innovation Hub. We were launched in 2016, and current's mission is to grow the blue economy, accelerate innovation, and solve persistent water challenges. So why are we here? First of all, because we, there are a number of pressing water challenges. We all agree that we need more healthy water to drink and less flood water in our basements. Here in Illinois, we have issues like high nutrient runoff, lead pipes, rising Michigan, Lake Michigan levels, and some places actually experience water scarcity. Unlike everywhere, our waters are being affected by my microplastics and so-called forever chemicals like, such as PFOA and PFAS. Secondly, we need more high paying quality jobs and the water sector can offer them. Current helps water startups grow and supports innovations that transform the water sector and create new jobs. So the, the water challenges are many and there are many solutions, but it can often be difficult to bring different stakeholders together to solve them. People are not rallying fast enough behind new ideas and technologies that will protect our health and environment. That's why Current builds partnerships among businesses, um, governments, researchers, and industries who are willing to take rational risks and try out new solutions. And Current takes the role of an unbiased advocate for the best solutions and policies. We keep track of innovations, we assess solutions, and we recommend the best ones for others to try and for us to pilot. Yes, we are more than a connector, we do test new technologies. So 
So right now we have a pilot and we're, we're testing several technologies for real-time water quality monitoring. Uh, it's called H Now Chicago. And there are other projects that are listed here that we're involved in, in our sewage surveillance, uh, another collaborative project that focuses on PFAS elimination and energy efficiency, and a thermal energy recovery project. All right, so now I would like to introduce Dr. Seth Darling. He is director of the Center for Molecular Engineering and senior scientist at Argonne National Lab. And Dr. Darling will introduce our speaker today. Thanks, Vailana. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Stephen Johns. Uh, Steve got his PhD in physical chemistry from the University of Minnesota. And afterwards, he moved directly into the water treatment industry, where he's been involved in water treatment research for nearly 30 years now. For most of that time, Steve has been located at the Film Tech site. It's previously the headquarters of Dow Water and Process Solutions and now uh, DuPont Water Solutions. And his title uh, with DuPont is an R&D Fellow, where his research activities have focused on reverse osmosis, nanofiltration, and ultrafiltration, uh, membrane formation, and applications, as well as aspects of element fabrication and testing methods. He was the principal chemist responsible for several of Dow's commercial product launches. He's an inventor on more than 40 issued US patents, and his current role involves identifying research opportunities and acting as a technical advisor to several research platforms in DuPont Water Solutions. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Steve, and we're looking forward to what you have to share with us today. I'm unmuted now. Um, share the screen. We'll share that screen and start. Um, okay, so did that come up fine? Jolly. Okay, so before I start, um, I'll know right. I'm, your screen's not sharing. My screen is not sharing. Yes. Sorry. Um, let's figure out why. Sorry about that. Um, share screen. If I do that. Oh, I need to press. Got it. There we go. Now it should be, right? Um, so I'll say, how about that? There okay, we go. thank you. Perfect, thank you. All right. So before I start, um, I'll note that, yeah, I, I worked actually 26 years um, at, at Dow, um, most of that time uh, in uh, Dow Water Solutions. Um, Dow, uh, about a few years back here, merged with DuPont. Uh, uh, they then did a split into three different companies. Um, we went with the new DuPont. Uh, we being Dow Water Solutions became DuPont Water Solutions. My role is, is uh, pretty similar in, in the uh, new company here. And, um, and uh, DuPont Water Solutions is uh, very similar to Dow, um, except I think there maybe there's a, a larger thrust on growth than there was. Um, but anyway, we sell a number of different uh, uh, equipment pieces for various different waters uh, and non-water applications. Um, essentially, we're the largest producer now of reverse osmosis uh, membrane, uh, as well as nanofiltration membrane um, and ultrafiltration membrane and uh, ion exchange resins. But in this particular talk, I'll be uh, focusing on nanofiltration and reverse osmosis. So reverse osmosis and nanofiltration membranes are mostly used to uh, remove salts and small molecules um, from water. Um, nanofiltration can often be understood as, say, a loose RO, and that's a reasonable way to look at it. Um, you know, a lot of times you don't need the same rejection as RO, and there's an energy advantage if you can go with nanofiltration. But many of the applications also have some degree of selectivity associated with nanofiltration. Um, for instance, you might be taking out divalence or maybe there's a different molecular weight range that you're looking for. Um, in any case, I have two sort of prototypical uh, SEMs below uh, showing an RO membrane and an NF membrane. Um, they're both made by interfacial polymerization as are uh, almost all ROs now and, and most uh, nanofiltration membranes. Um, the barrier layer, uh, is about, can people see my cursor if I move it about? Um, 
Okay, yeah. well, the barrier yeah. layer anyway is about, uh, in this case, about 200 nanometers, um, and it's more rugose for the RO membrane. Uh, the NF membrane is uh, thinner and, um, and usually uh, smoother. Um, of course, we can vary these things as well. So I gather there's sort of a diverse audience that could be here. And so I'll just quickly make the connection, you know, with osmosis, you have the flow from the low concentration to the high concentration, and that can cause the water level to raise um, through the semi-permeable membrane event. Uh, in reverse osmosis, we apply pressure to the high concentration side uh, to overcome the osmotic pressure and then apply more pressure to essentially force the water through the uh, semi-permeable membrane to end up with a lower concentration uh, permeates um, that we get. And uh, this is the same whether it's reverse osmosis um, or nanofiltration, and that's how we're able to produce uh, pure water from, say, seawater. Um, so certainly uh, reverse osmosis had been uh, researched for a, a quite a while before this. Um, however, it's sort of an interesting, um, uh, an interesting coincidence that the um, first Commercial reverse osmosis elements were actually produced by DuPont um, about 1969. And they were a hollow fiber membrane made out of a linear aromatic polyamide. Um, not too long thereafter, Dow Chemical introduced, uh, entered the market as well. And they also introduced uh, their product as a, uh, you know, it was a hollow fiber membrane again. Uh, this one made out of cellulose triacetate. And then uh, later, Toyobo also got into this with similarly a uh, hollow fiber uh, cellulose triacetate element or membrane that went into the element, right? Um, so actually, Dow was the first to leave uh, this group here. Uh, they exited the market and uh, then started working with the company FilmTech Corporation on a flat sheet membrane uh, to do reverse osmosis. Um, and uh, DuPont left around the late 90s. They uh, retired from this. and. Uh, their main technical challenge at that time was fouling of their outside to, to inside hollow fiber. Um, but additionally, they'd also been working with flat sheet internally and realized, oops, I got, went a little bit faster, but realized effectively that um, the uh, permeability and such were just gonna be better with the uh, technology from film tech that Dow had. So um, what was that technology? Um, for some reason I have just got to clear my, well, I can't do that. Okay, well, anyway, I'll, uh, just having a little trouble presenting, but the uh, technology that Dow acquired from FilmTech was a composite membrane. Uh, it's three layers. I'll just start with the top layer. That's the thin film polyamide that actually discriminates, does the rejecting uh, of uh, salts. And that's on top of a porous support that, that, that is important during the, uh, the polymerization of that thin film. Um, but it also supports the polyamide in operation and distributes flow uh, to the uh, layer below it, the um, non-woven polyester membrane. And, and that layer is there to essentially provide the strength so that it can span uh, gaps in the permeate space or uh, at, you know, many hundreds of PSI. So um, the, uh, the thin film composite membrane upon which this is based, uh, the process for making it is shown here. Essentially, you start with this porous support layer and you imbibe a monomer into that that's uh, at least a difunctional amine, um, you know, trimesial chloride, uh, I'm sorry, metaphenylene diamine is um, most commonly at least involved in uh, RO membranes. Piperazine in the uh, F NF membranes is often used. Um, you wipe off the excess and then put a, um, an oil phase on top of this water phase reactant. And at the interface, and this is trimesial chloride, usually that's the case. There are a few others, but that's, that's common. Um, at the interface, you get a reaction between these two monomers that forms the polyamide. And uh, conveniently, it's a self-limiting reaction for a few different reasons, but one of which is that the monomers don't cross over very well uh, as after this polyamide layer is formed, at least as rapidly. And so you tend to get a faster reaction where you don't have polyamide or where it's a very thin region. And for that reason, then we're able to make a self-healing process that makes a very thin membrane. And that's really why uh, this interfacial polymerization is, is so advantaged in uh, making these membranes. Now, essentially, almost all of our membrane is going to go into spiral wound elements, as that's a way to essentially pack a large amount of membrane into a small space. 
And in terms of sort of describing that, we have a, a feed spacer and a folded membrane sheet and a permeate spacer that are all wound around this tube. And sort of the critical thing to know is that, you know, the feed spacer is in contact with the outside of the element, but you can't go from the feed spacer to the permeate spacer without crossing the membrane. And then once you have done that, you can travel down the permeate spacer towards the tube um, and, and leave the element as, as fresh water. And this design, essentially, it's a two leaf element. Um, we make elements that have from one leaf to actually 127 leaves, um, 123 leaves. But um, you know, a number of different elements are possible. The standard is an eight inch diameter element, maybe has you know, between 20 and 30 leaves. And, and that's what this guy is pushing into the vessel here. Now, some plants can have an awful lot of vessels. Um, and, and this one here uh, has a lot. Um, there's actually eight of these 40 inch long elements uh, in each of these vessels here. I'm sorry, I have a footer on the thing that's probably gonna hang with us, I apologize for that. Um, not sure why that came in. Uh, so um, this is a, uh, um, a, a Sarek um, and it's a plant in Israel. It's unique for several different reasons. Um, one of which is that um, it's the only plant in the world that uses 16 inch diameter elements uh, as shown here, 16 inch diameter, 40 inches long. Uh, they go into these vessels and it's also unique because um, you know, it has this unique vertical arrangement for vessels. There's, uh, there's the bottoms, the tops, and there's seven of these elements there between. But really it's uh, particularly unique because it produces more than 600,000 meters cubed per day of treated water. Um, and, and actually, um, there is actually a Sarek B planned and already uh, bid out, um, and uh, that will be of similar capacity. Um, but just between this one and the Ashkelon one before and a few other similar plants, uh, Israel actually gets now 80% of its potable water um, from desalination. And um, they also have 90% uh, of the sewage that they produce is actually uh, reused as well, which further uses uh, RO elements. Well, um, so big plants, uh, these large desalination systems get a lot of focus and they can be sexy just uh, due to their size. Um, however, uh, this um, third coast in this third coast seminar, it's sort of incongruous, it seems to be talking much about uh, desalination. Um, but fortunately, I can say that, um, you know, uh, substantially more of our membranes uh, actually goes into uh, industrial applications and brackish water applications than it does into uh, desalination. And so this plant, much smaller, there's a lot of them, though, uh, and uh, it's somewhat you know, representative of what more of these things look like. And then we also make very small elements, um, such as this residential one, which goes into uh, an under sink residential unit like maybe this one shown here. Um, unless maybe I'm in China and then you actually put these things on top of a counter because they can be a status symbol or, uh, or actually even in the sitting room and combine it with uh, you know, something to warm the water and make tea. But um, you know whether they're uh, um, whether they're uh, small systems, big systems, um, or even since you know those early days of Dupont hollow fibers, you know fouling has been a problem uh, in reverse osmosis, um, and people are generally uh, you know that term is sort of general. It's nondescript as to exactly what we mean is happening, but there's several different uh, categories. You know, this top picture here is an image of the scroll face of an element um, that uh, has problems with particulates and they certainly are within the uh, feed spacer as well. Um, below here, I have an image instead of, a, uh, of an element that's been fouled with uh, colloids, um, iron in this case here. Um, additionally, there are many smaller species that are problematic due to interactions with the surface of the membrane, um, you know, such as polysaccharides or surfactants, oils, humics. Um, and uh, essentially these top three categories are a huge, a huge topic, and I'll not be addressing them here. Um, uh, instead, I, I'm gonna be focusing on, uh, on this smaller area, scaling uh, and biofouling, which both of them are, are important uh, very much as well. So scaling and biofouling can be sort of bookends for a system. 
Um, you know, essentially biofouling is going to occur in the first element in the system and, uh, and uh, spread from there. Similarly, scaling is often seen in the last element uh, in a system and, and work backwards from, uh, from that. And we'll go into that in a little more detail. Starting with scaling. Um, scaling can occur on the membrane um, or within the feed spacer, or it can be in often in, in both of these. Um, and uh, in terms of its impact, you know, it results in uh, lower flux, lower, lower permeability of the system there, um, as well as a pressure drop uh, across the feed side of the system from say one end of the vessel to the other. Why does it occur? Um, well, so essentially, Feeding the RO system is going to be a, a feed stream and uh, it's split into two parts. You have the uh, permeate stream, which is the treated water and the reject stream uh, where essentially uh, the salts that are in here, most of these will end up over here. Um, and a, uh, a recovery is defined as the volume of permeate divided by the volume of feed. And it's illustrated here as 25% recovery. Um, which is not too common, say for, I mean, not uncommon for a residential unit, um, say, you know, five, 10 years ago or so. Um, however, now in different parts of the world, they want higher recoveries, you know, less wasted water here. Um, and so 75% is, is desired in many places. Um, and in that case, then that reject stream is going to have more salts. It's going to be more likely supersaturated, more likely to scale. And if we're looking at uh, larger systems, um, you know, for industrial or municipal applications or so that are more brackish water, um, scaling is also a problem there. Um, you know, we can get to commonly, you know, 70, 85% recovery uh, for uh, brackish water feed. And, and you can imagine here, um, this is actually is a two-stage system. So just to clarify the the reject stream from this first stage feeds becomes the feed to the second stage. Um, and so if I get 50% of the recovery when the water passes through here, and then I were to do something close to another 50% here, that means that 75% of my water becomes permeate, which means that my salts are all concentrated in the back end of the system. And, uh, and so that's, you know, this can be a high concentration water, that's where it's going to scale. Now, um, Scaling is obviously going to depend on the uh, constituents in their water, um, their concentration, and the recovery at which you're, you're operating. Um, and so if I considered 75% recovery and thought about a well-rejected species in the feed, it's going to essentially be at four times that concentration uh, it, at the back end of the element there. And if I'm talking about, say, calcium carbonate as an example, that's four times as high for the calcium and the carbonate there. Um, or something close to that. And, uh, and it's actually worse than that um, because of polarization. So you imagine that uh, an element or maybe a membrane has all this water flowing towards the membrane and some of that's gonna make it through as permeate, right? And, and some of the other ions, they're not gonna go through the membrane. So they got to essentially either diffuse or mix back into the bulk solution. And um, inevitably that's going to result in a higher concentration at the membrane surface than in the bulk. And even if we were to take into account the polarization, um, you know, we can still calculate uh, whether um, scaling will occur eventually. Um, but essentially uh, that doesn't take into account the, the, the methods that we do this really don't take into account the, the kinetics of the scaling process or the dynamics within the element. Um, and uh, anyway, so uh, I guess I would note that, that um, yeah, anyway, I'll leave it there. Uh, what I'll introduce, I'll catch it a little bit later. Um, so there are a lot of conventional processes that can be used uh, to say, for instance, treat the feed water and um, reduce the potential for scaling. And I'll just, uh, I'm not gonna dwell on these, but I'll mention a few of these things. You know, we could have a pH adjustment, um, you know, down with carbonates, um, up with silica. Uh, we can induce precipitation um, so that, uh, you know, such as lime softening. Uh, to, to get rid of ions. Um, we can exchange problematic ions such as, uh, you know, calcium for sodium uh, with ion exchange. Uh, Anti-scalants also work by several different mechanisms uh, um, to prevent scale formation and attachment. And that can be either um, within the, uh, the, you know, 
within the bulk stream um, or on the membrane surface to prevent, to prevent nucleation and growth. And so these conventional um, processes are, are used. And what I would like to point out is that um, I'm not saying throw these away as I go forward. I'm gonna be introducing some other things and it's and uh, not or, uh, they, they can augment uh, the situation. So another way to reduce scaling would be to have improve the membrane uh, with respect to this. And between the, um, the membrane itself and any coatings we apply to it, uh, there are several parameters that can affect this. Um, we can vary the interfacial polymerization uh, to um, result in uh, you know, smooth or rougher membranes. Um, there are several ways that we can change the uh, charge in the membrane. Um, and we can also uh, modify the membrane such as with coatings to change the, uh, the polymer type. Now, I decided um, that I'm not really going to be speaking about membranes uh, very much on either of these two talks here. Um, but about five years ago, I went to a conference and I wanted to introduce some, you know, some commercially available or you know, uh, essentially things that would be in the literature um, that one could speak about, uh, about the impact of membrane on scaling. And so I, I was able to find a few of these things. You know, there's uh, a modification of the surface of the membrane that was able to, to change the, the time for onset of scaling. and you know, the difference between uh, cellulose acetate and, and polyamide in terms of uh, uh, scaling potential. Um, there's a, a neat paper by Nuruf um, that uh, describes some work at Boulder where essentially they had imprinted the membrane uh, uh, with a nano pattern and, and that had an implication in, uh, for scaling. Um, although, well, I'm not gonna get into the details here, but, um, and, and then, you know, some more fundamental stuff that essentially just introduces, you know, how, how inhomogeneities in the membrane and, and the support layer can, uh, can impact fouling, but the same thing would apply also to, uh, to scale formation, the higher flux, um, you know, place where that might start. Okay, that was about five years ago. Um, you know, I note that nowadays uh, there are you know, several more papers um, that are more particular to relating the membrane properties themselves uh, to scale formation and that propensity. Um, and, and this list here, I, I'm sure is 100% not uh, inclusive of all, but it also doesn't uh, it contain papers that weren't associated with RL, so things that happen to use surrogate uh, surfaces, um, which can be very informative in the thing. Um, I will note that the, you know, as an example, um, there's some, some very good work in here, but as an example, this bottom paper here, I just pulled that one out, for instance, uh, it was the most recent one I saw there, but uh, in this particular case, the uh, Menis group had, um, had uh, put sulfonic acids on one of our membranes um, by two different approaches there. Um, in both cases had seen relative to a uh, silica feed that uh, it had less uh, decrease in flux over time um, uh, in that scaling environment. Well, as I said, I'm not going to concentrate on the membrane, um, but I will note that you know uh, our membranes go into spiral wound elements, and so you know what can we do? I'm going to talk a little bit about what we can do relative to the element in terms of scaling. Um, and before I did, you know, I've already talked a little bit about the element, but I wanted to make sure you understood the flow patterns in this um, because they'll be relevant in the next few slides. So again, uh, the spiral wound element has the the feed spacer. Um, and the permeate spacer and these membrane sheets. And essentially, you know, the feed goes across the membrane from one side or the element from one side to the other and through this feed spacer. If you propagate through the membrane, you can get to the permeate side where essentially you propagate down this permeate spacer towards the tube and then the fresh water uh, leaves through this central tube. So um, essentially the, the, all these elements are gonna have a feed spacer. The primary purpose of this feed spacer is just to separate these two sheets of, of membrane and to, um, to essentially create a channel for the feed flow. Um, and this spacer is a relatively inexpensive uh, extruded net, uh, diagonal net here. And um, you know, sort of like what you might have uh, around a turkey at Thanksgiving. Um, but it actually is uh, very important in terms of, uh, of scale. Um, if you think about it, if you just decrease the thickness of this feed spacer, that means that the velocity in this channel for the same uh, amount of water you put through is going to have to increase. Um, and uh, 
one of the effects of that uh, is that the uh, the ions, for instance, are going to spend less time in the element, and so you know that may reduce the chance for nucleation. Um, but uh, also, um, certainly as important here is going to be the fact that the uh, mixing is going to be increased by doing this, uh, and that reduces polarization, uh, and so the concentration at the surface will be less. Um, and uh, you know, mixing uh, is going to depend on several factors that we can change in these spacers, such as the strand count and the strand angle, and you know how much necking or essentially the, the shape of the strand that we're going to be getting here. And I'll also note um, that you know, typically, if I'm going to calculate polarization for an element, you know, the common way to do this is you'll sort of take the bulk properties that you measure for the element in operation, and you know, you end up with you know, that's you know, get some formulas for flow and and such that relate to polarization. But if you look on a smaller scale, um, you know, the, the polarization is also going to depend very much on flow patterns within this diagonal net and also on the contact points um, with the membrane. And so those do impact uh, uh, scale formation. So here's just an example. Um, I have a simple system. I'm going to have element A and element B. I'm operating them at the same flux, the same recovery. Um, and essentially, they were we tried to make them so that they're the same element, except that element B is made with a thinner feed spacer. And we can indeed see that if you're looking at the flux loss during operation in a scaling environment, um, and this happens to be calcium carbonate, you you um, you know it's a little bit above the uh, the uh, equilibrium concentration, but it's being concentrated up, right? You can see that this, this thinner element, anyway, though has um, you know is able to last longer than the conventional. Um, element, or at least the one with the thicker feed spacer there. And I meant thinner element, the thinner feed spacer. So beyond selection of components used, you know, the element design is also important. And there are several things that we can do here as well. Um, what I'm showing here is uh, a drawing of a unrolled uh, membrane leaf. You know, and there's the tube sort of like shown here uh, with this residential element. Um, you know, in a uh, conventional design here, we have the feed flow, it's across the element like this. Um, if the permeate goes through the membrane, uh, it can go into the, the, the permeate channel and then it moves down the permeate channel towards the product water tube where it leaves. Um, but the permeate channel has some resistance to it. And because of that, you end up with a higher net driving pressure next to the tube than you do at the back of the element. And a higher net driving pressure means that you have a higher flux near the tube. And that means also you have a higher polarization and thus higher concentration at the membrane surface, right? At the same time, you know, water is flowing, the feed water is flowing across the element like this. And, um, and that means that, you know, I'm, I'm permeating during this time, losing water. And so at the back end of the leaf, at the reject end or the concentrate end, you have a higher concentration here. And uh, they, they essentially will overlap at a corner down here. And that's actually where, you know, that's highest concentration here, highest concentration here. That's where the scaling will begin. Um, that's what you see in the models which you work. And that's what we see in reality when we open these things up and, uh, and uh, start looking at them. And then the scale essentially proceeds outward from that space. And so the fact that essentially reality works like this uh, also tells you that the permeate spacer is also important uh, in terms of scale formation or, uh, or avoidance. So another important factor um, can be the flow path. And uh, here I'm going to uh, just describe, um, you know, this is our conventional flow path that we'd have. I should point out, I'm sort of showing the geometry for a residential element. Um, you know, it happens to be long in this one direction and shorter in this direction. Not elements are, not all elements are, you know, some are more um, squarish in this case here. <coughs> but in this case here, you know, if I have feed flowing across like this, it's a shorter distance than feed flowing like this. Um, uh, you can induce a, a this is, I would refer to as axial flow. You can induce a radial flow by several different means. Um, you know, here, for instance, I have, you know, if I put an opening at one end of the vessel near the, the tube, and it, sorry, at the one end of the element near the tube, and the uh, other end, the, uh, the opening might be near the periphery, um, you can induce this axial flow. It's a longer flow, um, but then at the if I'm comparing at the same um, flux and recovery as is probably relevant, uh, you find that the velocity is going to be higher uh, here than it is going to be across there. Um, and so that results in more mixing, other things being equal uh, and uh, and less scale um, going on. 
More so, um, getting back to, you know, previously we talked about the fact that we have these overlapping regions of high concentration. Uh, in a axial flow design, the maximum concentration in the feed is going to be where it exits the element over here, but we still have the highest flux down near the tube. And so you don't overlap these regions of, of uh, that, that both accentuate concentration at the surface. And so that's also good for avoiding scale formation. So this is another experiment, um, sort of like I described before, we're in a, uh, uh, essentially, the, we operate the element initially below the scaling potential, but you concentrate up the, uh, the, the fluid within it and, it and it goes over that. And, and we are seeing uh, uh, a loss in, in flux over time, um, but it is less for the radial flow uh, design than for the axial flow. Again, all things being equal. And, and I would note that um, there are certainly other things that one could have done with the axial flow and, and are done um, to improve it. Um, but, but this is trying to keep other things being equal in this case. So unfortunately, the previous two uh, experimental plots I showed were gathered over about three or four weeks. Um, and there's a lot of things that you'd like to be able to look at. I mean, you know, the, the um, there are a lot of things with element geometry, you know, how many leaves, what's the impact of, of area and, uh, and of membrane type that I put in these things. And so you'd like a, a different process. Um, this is going to be a different experiment. I'll try to describe it here. Here I've started with two conventional elements, element A, element B. I'm varying a parameter in this thing that I care about, trying to see if it has an impact on uh, scale formation. Um, and so I have several of both of these elements. I'm running them at two different concentrations, uh, or I'm sorry, not to concentrates, two different recoveries. Um, so this one will you know, get to higher concentrations. Um, and what I do is I take these elements when I'm done and I unroll them and I cut out coupons where I expect you know, in, these, in these elements to have scale formation. I cut out two coupons and then I dissolve uh, any uh, calcium on the surface uh, in acid and subject them to ICP and then measure the amount of calcium. And what we see is that, yes, indeed, I can see a difference between element A and element B and also a, uh, a difference in the recoveries. And effectively, I'm getting the same result for, um, for both of these coupons, which um, makes you feel good. Uh, so that gives you an opportunity for, for uh, supporting more experiments. And this is another experiment, a little bit different than that one. Um, in this case here, I have a, uh, um, two types of elements again. Um, and I have an axial flow and a radial flow element and the uh, feed goes across the thing uh, for the radial flow and uh, the axial flow is you know, the conventional thing. And essentially I'm gonna cut out now nine different coupons from these instead. Measure, you know, again, measure by ICP how much calcium is on the surface. And in the case of the uh, axial flow, um, you know, we find that scale occurs you know, where we expect it uh, out here. In the case of the radio flow with this design, um, I'm seeing scale at the back end of the surface out here. Um, and uh, anyway, um, so, it, you know, both of the, that's interesting, in uh, interesting of itself here. I guess the other factor though that I should point out is that there's an order of magnitude difference um, uh, in terms of the actual amount of scale that I'm seeing, which is also uh, interesting. Again, you know, all things being equal um, because they're not necessarily run that way. So there are other ways, um, you know, there are several other ways that I could design systems, which is sort of where I'm sort of progressing next to that try to avoid scaling problems. You know, conventionally, one of the things you want to do is uh, increase the velocity, uh, particularly in that last element in series, um, maybe in the whole vessel. Uh, and, and one of the ways you do that is essentially set up a recirculation. This is, you know, fairly common practice. Um, you can also uh, have a uh, two-stage system and have a highly tapered design where multiple vessels feed a single vessel. So the flow in, in this last one where scale might occur is just at a higher velocity. You know, you can sort of push this uh, concept a little bit further. VSEP um, is, a, uh, uh, is a company that has introduced an oscillating, you know, sort of it's like a plate and frame, but an oscillating unit that essentially creates very high shear. Um, and that's able to run to uh, higher concentrations without scaling. And actually when they do scale, they get sort of a different morphology for the scale that, that does form uh, because it's probably being broken off the surface and such during the process. And then there are, are um, several other scale forming, um, th there are several ways that we might remove scale forming ions um, from within the RO system when we're running. Um, you know, I'll just mention one of these, uh, you know, essentially if I, if I run this RO uh, stage 
to a point where we have a super saturated solution, I might do something to induce uh, scale formation and then remove it, such as um, you know use a filter at this point. Um, but you know there are other operations that, that can be useful in this NF uh, ED uh, ion exchange or electric coagulation. And you could also put some of that up front here if you just wanted to get rid of the ions initially. Um, uh, although so, to some extent that moves your scale problem around. There are also several techniques that take advantage of the time dependence uh, associated with um, building scale. Um, and, um, and essentially I'll go through, uh, you know, particularly we'd like, to, we'd like to potentially be able to, you know, either detach the scale, uh, dissolve the scale, or maybe remove it, uh, the ions before we have time to uh, nucleate. And so I'll just touch on a few of these. Um, you know, flow reversal, feed flow reversal is one. You can imagine in a, a vessel, I'm flowing in this direction, my CL is gonna form over here. If I could switch the direction of my feed flow, um, you know, I could then get scale to form over here and maybe this region has an opportunity to either dissolve or just detach from, uh, from the movements that go on when, when things like that happen. Um, and that process is actually used, there's a company, Rotec, that sells a, um, a two-stage system where effectively the valves uh, switch this around so first stage vessels become second stage vessels and so on and the flow directions change. There's also a very new entry into this area, um, uh, Pulse Flow RO sold by IDE. Um, and in this case here, the vessel is actually operated in dead end. You have feed water flowing in um, and you have uh, um, uh, permeate going out, but you don't have a, a concentrate stream. And so that goes on for maybe a minute or so and then they'll um, open a valve and you know for for a matter of a couple seconds um you'll get a, a burst of flow through there and the idea is that um you can concentrate these ions on the membrane surface uh but you try to remove them before nucleation takes place um interesting uh but anyway i'll go on the next one is is closed circuit ro um uh that's essentially a batchwise operation um, I'm going to talk about it on a separate thing on a separate page here. Um, essentially, uh, CCRO or closed circuit RO uh, comes from Desalitech. DuPont purchased Desalitech uh, about a little more than a year ago here. Um, let me sort of introduce what's going on here. You have a, a feed flow. It's uh, going into the vessels. Um, and then we have a permeate flow, which is equal to the feed flow that's going in. Um, now that isn't operating in dead end, however, though. We still have, the con we still have a, a concentrate flow, except that we're routing it back into the feed end of the system again. And so as an effect, we, you know, this, this recirculation is taking place while we're adding feed and taking out permeates. So the ions in the feed are being concentrated in this recirculation loop. You know, the osmotic pressure is going up, so we have to increase the, uh, the applied pressure during that same time to uh, keep an equivalent uh, permeate. Um, but the concentration keeps going up until such time as, as we specify, this is gonna be the maximum concentration. And then you open up a valve and bleed all of the concentrate flow out of your system, uh, replacing it at the same time with fresh feed. Um, and, uh, and then essentially the process starts over again. So relative to scale, if I think of a, of a traditional system, that last element in series, as I pointed out, that's gonna be where the concentration is highest and it's highest forever, right? It doesn't change. And so that's where we have problems with scaling. In this case here, um, that last element in series uh, is at that highest concentration only for a little while. And then it goes back to uh, a very low concentration again. Um, and, uh, and so that actually can be advantageous uh, for scale formation. This is some data that was acquired um, before DuPont actually acquired Desalitech. Um, it's essentially, uh, uh, it was run at the sanitation districts of Los Angeles. And what we have here is a, um, a CCRO system uh, from Desalitech uh, in parallel with a three-stage uh, traditional RO system. Um, they're both being uh, run off the same feed water um, with anti-scalants. Both of these um, devices are limited in their recovery by silica scaling. But what we can see is that um, the uh, Desalitech system required many less cleanings uh, than did the, uh, sorry, 
than did the um, uh, conventional RO system uh, during the, the time of this experiment. And uh, I'll note that we're currently in the process with IndyPont of um, building new equipment, uh, you know, essentially some uh, CCRO systems in parallel with uh, uh, some uh, large conventional systems so that we can actually run similar type experiments with uh, different ions, concentrations and such to uh, understand better where the, the limitations lie uh, in this process. Okay, I'm now gonna progress on to um, biofouling and, uh, and its avoidance. Um, so we certainly know biofouling is a problem at higher temperatures. Um, you know, 70% of plants in the Middle East are reported to have problems with biofouling. Um, it's a problem with surface waters. 80% um, of surface water plants in the U.S. are reported to have uh, problems with biofouling. And then I'll also note from internal VOCs, um, in industrial wastewater, uh, it's also a significant issue there and probably underappreciated. So there are a lot of common, uh, common wisdom that can go into avoiding biofouling. Um, you know, certainly probably most important, good pretreatment uh, is important. Um, you know, especially ultrafiltration is very effective here. Not fully, but, you know, effective. Um, you know, when I started, it was, you know, com the common practice is you chlorinate the system up until you get to the RO, uh, which doesn't like chlorine. And so you dechlorinate that part of the system. Uh, it's recognized now that that can be a problem um, uh, because it increases the assimilable organic uh, carbon, um, uh, you know, degrading it. And that acts as food for the bugs, which actually can be a big problem um, with biofouling in the system. And so oftentimes that's avoided. Um, uh, what can be very useful is a non-oxidizing biocide like DBNPA, very effective, um, but it is more expensive. Unfortunately, these things and some others not working. Uh, another option is to clean frequently and, and that would be unfortunate. So anyway, what can we do to avoid that clean frequently situation? So certainly we know that membranes and feed spacers will have an impact um, on this. I'm not gonna be focusing on that though. Um, uh, I'm going to go into some other um, uh, methods that we can use to uh, avoid biofouling. Um, as I start, though, I again, point out, you know, biofouling, as I said earlier, uh, is going to be on the uh, first element in series and, and then grow from there. And the reason for that is because um, biofouling is quickly limited by available nutrients in the system. And so that may be, you know, the organic carbon, uh, it may be oxygen. Uh, maybe phosphorus or something else. Um, but biofouling really is seen in that first element initially and actually early in that first element and, and then it, it takes a bit to propagate. Um, so, um, you know, we in DuPont have been looking at what I would refer to as a biocontactor for, you know, about eight years or so, but we have recently introduced um, Be Free. Uh, which is a uh, new product here. Um, and essentially what it does is it takes this biofouling that is going to occur and it puts it in a place that we can deal with it better. Um, and uh, so we're using it as pretreatment upstream of the RO. Um, it provides biofouling at a place that's easy to, to clean right here. Um, and uh, ideally gets rid of at least one of these limited nu limiting nutrients so that we don't see the uh, same growth in the RO stage. And as a safeguard, uh, the system also includes a phosphate removing resin um, uh, to uh, remove that nutrient as well uh, to keep the RO safe. So um, this gives one visual example of what we're talking about looking at the media for, uh, for bio growth. Um, we have a clear tube here we're doing this experiment in instead, um, but you can see essentially at the top layer, we have a lot of biofouling there. You know, you go down here and uh, uh, much more clean uh, bed still would do some filtration, but, but you know, the biofouling isn't there. But you can see the pressure um, is increasing uh, going across here, um, 0.75 bar in this last case here. You know, we can set a pressure that we would say this is acceptable for a pressure drop across uh, this uh, media here, um, and, because that's essentially going to be, um, you know, subtracted from your net driving pressure for your RO. So you set some pressure that you find is acceptable across there, and then you're going to have to clean it. 
the easiest way to clean this thing uh, is either an air scour or a, uh, or a backwash um, uh, system here. Um, and, and effectively what it's gonna do is it's gonna disrupt this biofouling layer and put it up here in the water. And then you can essentially flush that out retaining uh, the, the media. Um, and uh, that does a fairly good job in cleaning it as, as I'll show here, this is um, some data. Uh, essentially, obviously, over quite a period of time, seven months, um, where essentially backwash was done every five days on this thing. And the point I wanted to bring up here is that the um, the low values, you know, essentially, uh, yeah, the, the the pressure drop increases in each case, but it is returning to a a low value and a constant low value over all this time. So obviously, we're doing a reasonable job of uh, effectively cleaning this system. But um, but cleaning a uh, system, um, well, essentially what's really important is what happens in the RO, right? Downstream of the thing. And as I mentioned, biofouling uh, is evidenced by, you know, among other things, this pressure drop across the vessel. And so that's what we're looking at here. We have two situations. One is before the bee free process was introduced into this thing. And you can see all the different cleanings which are required as the pressure drop increased across the vessel here and after the bee free was introduced into this thing. And so you can see it's, um, it's uh, being uh, quite effective uh, market improvement. So at this point, I was also just going to return to the desalitech system for a moment. Um, in the field, they're seeing very little impact of biofouling where one might expect it. Um, and so one hypothesis is, um, well, let's see, if we think about it, remember I was talking about how the concentration, you know, we have feed going in, permeate out, and this concentration in the recirculation loop keeps increasing over time there sort of like shown here, and then it drops, right? Well, it may be that this um, you know, high concentration, low concentration oscillating situation here, uh, the bugs just don't like it, right? And uh, that may be uh, curtailing some of the biogrowth that one might have expected out in the field. And so we, are, we also are setting up systems specifically uh, to examine this as well. And I'm really looking forward to uh, see that because that could be a, a very impactful situation as well. So, Finally, yeah, I'd um, like to, to acknowledge some people here. John Johnson, uh, my uh, element expert, love, uh, he's been involved in, um, in both the, uh, the biofouling work uh, and the uh, scaling studies. Um, you know, Guillaume and Mark Schluck are, are, uh, have been really our champions uh, recently for the Be Free product. Um, and uh, Jessica Shu and Mike Kreltz have been involved in gathering uh, some of this data here for scaling studies. Um, I'd uh, also like to uh, thank you for listening um, and uh, we'll be glad to uh, field questions. Um, so there we go. We thank going? you so much for this excellent presentation. Uh, that was really interesting, really great level. Uh, I actually did have a chance to work on a project with our own systems and actually it was Desalitech that was was following the data uh, on it. So it's really uh, interesting to hear. I wish I could actually listen to your presentation before I started working on that project. It was so clear. Um, so the questions, you, know, you, you explained really well how, what are the different ways you can manipulate the system to reduce the scaling of biofouling, like changing feed properties is one, membrane material modifications is the other, uh, feed spacer, that's another one, and then flow manipulation, so all this, these different strategies. We actually have questions that address or relate to these different strategies. So one question is, um, apologies, need to go back a little bit. Okay, uh, can you induce faster flow velocity at the membrane surface with more complex spacer geometries beyond a diagonal mesh pattern? Yeah. Well, so so can we induce faster jump? So as I said, you know, obviously we have less volume in the feed spacer, which happens really, you know, when I reduce the thickness of the feed spacer, that's going to make it faster. That was specifically what they were asking. Um, the other thing that they, you know, a variation on that question, I suppose, is could I induce more mixing at the surface of the membrane? And the answer is um, absolutely. Uh, different feed spacers can be chosen to induce mixing, you know, like, um, you know, I went back to that thing, uh, um, 
you know, I mentioned strand angle, right? I mean, if you widen that strand angle, so it's more perpendicular to the flow through there, that's going to have more mixing. Um, but most things that induce more mixing also induce more pressure drop. Um, and so that really is the trick. You have sort of two tricks in the feed space area. One is how do I make a spacer that does better mixing at the surface of the membrane where I would like? Um, and uh, also how do I make a cheap feed spacer? Um, and, uh, and those two are not necessarily going to, uh, to go well together, um, but they are both important. Uh, and then the other thing I'd point out is, remember I did show some diagrams of simulations and things like that. I mean, typically when we optimize feed spacer designs in the past, um, it's been around, you know, how do I reduce polarization for the element um, and keep my pressure drop low? But when you're looking at effects that may take place over that, you know, very small few millimeters of space, you know, like scale formation, where does it start? Um, you know, at that point, then you have to, you may be looking at different parameters that you have to optimize to make sure that you don't end up with spaces that are um, most effective, I'll say, for scale formation. Is that a, okay? Thank you. Yes, perfect. And that shows how many factors, different factors you need to consider when doing these modifications. So another question is uh, kind of related as how often the surface functionalization and modification being used in commercial membranes to minimize scaling and biofouling. Yeah. Um, so the answer is it is. Um, that was the area I chose not to talk about in this thing here, right? We have, you know, there's unfortunately being in an industry, we have you know, certain areas we can and don't and things like that. Um, but yeah, we certainly do take that into account as we try to uh, um, uh, create products that, that move forward there. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is, is anti-fouling the main issue limiting performance? And how about making more permeable membranes? Yeah. Okay, so anti-fouling is um, an issue, um, limiting performance, but it very uh, there's sort of two parts to that question, so I don't want to lose them both. Um, uh, so it's really system dependent as to what is going to be your limiting factor. I mean, recovery, for, if I'm talking as an example, an MLD, ZLD system, uh, that minimum liquid discharge or zero liquid discharge or something where I want to really get to high recoveries, then you're going to look at that thing and say, what is my factor, right? It may be... Um, uh, it may be fouling, but it may be, uh, um, you know, uh, when does the scaling occur on the thing? Uh, maybe an osmotic pressure limit. Um, so there, there are different things that could um, limit you. And the same thing is true for other systems too. We don't know for a given system what ends up, you know, limiting what you want, whether that's energy um, or, uh, or um, you know, recovery um, for your system. So it's a very, you know, system to, you know, place to place uh, uh, system as to what's going to limit us in each case. Um, and, and within following, it's what type of following you're actually talking about there. But relative to the question of permeability, you know, so where do we go? So permeability is generally advantageous, right? The more permeable my membrane is, um, the less energy, the less pressure I'm going to need to apply to get out the same amount of water. You could say I also just will apply the same amount of pressure and I'll just get out more water. But there are limits there um, because at some point you reach a point where uh, we're fouling, you know, as I go up and up in flux, at some point fouling is just much more likely you, uh, you reach a cliff where that's the case. And in any case, um, the system also has other uh, issues uh, that, that happen, um, you know, that, that essentially are going to cost money. So if I gave myself a, you know, one of these membranes that is often in the literature discussed that maybe a hundred or a thousand times more permeable, um, you know, there are other limits uh, that, that are not just associated with pushing water through the membrane that also chew up energy in your system. Uh, and so we certainly strive for more permeable membranes, uh, other things being equal, um, uh, but it's not necessarily the limiting factor. I have a... Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. You, uh, we, so we have a couple more questions. Um, also, we just, uh, you should see a poll. Uh, if you can answer those questions, that would be great. That really helps us. Um, so one question is, um, what are your thoughts on the potential of self-cleaning self membranes based on catalysis to address both biofouling and organic fouling? 
self-cleaning membranes based on catalysis. Okay, I will pass on this question because truthfully, I'm not sure which membranes we're speaking of for the thing. And so I, that tells me that I need to uh, spend uh, a little more time looking at some literature, which I uh, haven't looked at recently uh, uh, in, in this space here. So um, sorry about that, but uh, I jotted it, or at least am, am jotting it down so that I uh, learn something myself. Thank you. Great. Well, you can tell who this question came from. We have many researchers here who are, uh, you know, on the cutting edge of developing new technologies. So this is uh, this is great. Well, and actually, <laughs> we're always looking for for new technologies. Um, and I apologize um, um, for not being aware of that piece. Um, but hence, I will I'll pass on the uh, on the question. But I will look it up and uh, and learn something about it. Thank you. Okay, sounds great. And we have one more question. It's, um, I think, more general question re that relates to all uh, reverse osmosis systems in particular. So how do you manage the concentrate for desalination plants? So how do you manage the... Uh, so for desalination plants, typically, you know, obviously if I'm, if I'm uh, pulling water from the sea, I have a place to stick it back again, right? So that's uh, that's that's convenient. Um, and so typically, what they'll end up doing is they'll have a very large um, intake uh, where you take the the, uh, the the water, and ideally, it, you can you know co-locate it with something else that also needs that water, such as for cooling or something. But effectively, you bring it in, and then the trick is when you take it out, you want to distribute it over as wide a range as possible to avoid any um, environmental effects there. Um, but yeah, actually a lot of the cost in building uh, seawater desalination is in those intakes and outtakes for the, uh, for the process. And um, that's, that's convenient. You know, more problematic are, are uh, inland issues um, where, you know, you aren't able to put the water back again uh, into, you know, some body where you're allowed to, to leave it. And so, you know, in some places, you know, the water will just flow down to, you know, they will get a more concentrated stream. Uh, and then the next person in line will see that more concentrated stream. In other cases right now, ZLD, zero liquid discharge is, um, is uh, being considered more. Actually, India's oddly enough, sort of leading the way in that area um, um, in some of their industrial plants with dye treatments and such. Um, Okay. Anyway, I don't know whether did an acceptable answer for that or not, but um, we uh, it certainly uh, uh, high recovery systems are a key part of what we do research on, but you still do have to decide where you're going to put the concentrate at some point um, or get rid of it uh, by such as evaporation. Right, right. It's not exactly the topic for today's uh, seminar, but that's a really important issue too. So thank you for sharing your thoughts and on that. Um, so we'll, I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen again um, to finish up our event today. Really appreciate uh, the audience staying for a little bit longer. Um, all right, uh, so we, uh, at, at Current, uh, we always have some interesting events and in October, uh, October 12th through 17th, we are hosting Chicago Water Week. Uh, and Chicago Water Week is, is uh, just, uh, during, during this week, we have uh, partners who care about water or work in water present do events um, that are related to water and we promote these events. You can go on Current's website, you can find more information on, on what is happening uh, during this week. And please, if you have time, join these events. They're usually really interesting and there's always something to learn. And last but, but not least, uh, we're always looking for partners. Uh, Current is are powered by partnerships. We're a small team uh, with big ambitions uh, and we cannot do much without support of our stakeholders and partners. Like today is a good example uh, of an event that is supported by our research partners. Uh, so please uh, reach out if you'd like 
if you like what we do and if you can support us in some way, uh, please reach out and we'll have a conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you again for being today at this seminar and enjoy the rest of your day. Okay, very good. Thank you. And I think I just remembered uh, what, what we're probably referring to with uh, self-cleaning filters by catalysis. Um, probably the, the uh, Mike Geithner, the stuff that they were working on with generating air bubbles at the surface of the membrane. Um, I think that might be what we're talking about, but but not so anyway. And if so, what I would say is that um, I would like to see more data on its being effective because uh, um, uh, I, I'm not familiar with recent data to see how well it's gone. Okay, great. Yes, thank you so much. Definitely lots of interesting things that are happening and being developed. And there's, uh, that's why we have these seminars. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you so much.